Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Swanson. Look at all these people staring at you. They're waiting for you to say something that's going to change their lives. Probably shouldn't have had that third margarita. <laughs> <laughs> They're thinking, oh, motivational speaker. I thought she'd be skinnier. <laughs> yeah, so did I. According to last year's New Year's resolution, at this point, I was supposed to have lost 30 pounds and have buff arms. <laughs> Instead, I'm pretty sure my muffin top just had twins. <sighs> I guess I'll always struggle with my weight. Of course, my husband says when I say struggle, that implies I'm working at it. It's a shame he went missing. <laughs> I'm struggling to find him. <laughs> All these smart people in this room, thought leaders, they probably lay awake at night pondering the mysteries of the universe. I lay awake at night wondering what happens to their tattoos when big people lose weight. They're all like chains in the world, doing such great things. All I can think about is, is my friend still waiting for me in the lobby? Her name's Chardonnay. <laughs> She's a good friend. She was friends with my mama first. She's the reason I had kids. <laughs> Everybody's wondering, go well, I say the right thing, do the right thing. All I can look at is, gosh, did I draw my eyebrows on straight this morning? <laughs> Last week I was sleepy, woke up, drew one a good inch higher than the other. <laughs> Had to walk around all day looking suspicious. <laughs> Man, this is, this is nerve wracking. Being up here, it's like high school all over again. Pick me, pick me. And nobody ever picked me. High school, I remember that. I remember one of one of those members only jackets and the kind that actually said members only on it, not the Sears version that said we all belong. <laughs> I wanted a Corvette with leopard print seat covers, remember that, and a coconut air freshener. And did I get it? No, I got my Uncle Cooter's hand me down Dodge Dart. <laughs> Smelled like feet. <laughs> bumper was hanging off it was held on by duct tape had a sticker on it that said start a movement eat a prune <laughs> ah, what if this is like high school all over again and they don't like me here any more than they liked me then what if once more I'm the weird one in the room doing things a different way how am I going to stand up and stick out among all this competition in this crowded market? How am I going to get up here and do something more than just giving them 47 tips they could have learned on the internet without ever leaving their house in a day of information overload? How am I actually going to get their attention in a lasting way that changes their perspective? How am I going to get them to pick me? <sighs> Come on, Kelly, pull it together. You're going to write a story that says you failed before you've even started. Is that how you're going to play this? Why don't you give yourself a little bit more credit? Because you know that in every success and every failure in your life, it started with a moment like this. A moment where you looked in the mirror and you got to make the choice into the story you were going to write about yourself, about your boss, about your brand, about your customer. And you know the story you write becomes the life that you live. And if you want to change your life, girl, you need to change that story. So you put your big girl panties on and you smile. Is that another hair growing out of my chin? 
I get another one, I can braid them. <laughs> so come on, you smile. And you change your story. Because you got something to say. And it matters. So yeah, put those big girl panties on and smile. Because this is going to be great to be here with you today. And I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what is that voice telling you when you look in the mirror? What is it telling your employees? What is the story you are writing about the people that you serve, about your brand? And even more important, why do you care? Because according to the latest Gallup poll, 70% of the people are disengaged in the workforce. And if it goes unchecked, they're calling for in the next five to 10 years for it to go up to 85%. That means while we're sitting here working, 85% of the people out there have checked out. That means they have quit, they just haven't left yet. People bring me in to connect and engage them to the passion and purpose for what they do. Not to make them happy, not to make them feel good, but to show them that they value and to change the corporate narrative. And I love my job. And they're not just connected, disconnected on the inside. They're disconnected from people all around them. Employees don't trust leadership. Customers don't trust institutions. Consumers don't trust buyers. We don't have a leadership customer service team building problem. We have a trust problem, which means we have a connection problem. And I speak about how we can master the art of connection and create those remarkable experiences. I learned that, oh, 20 years ago when I was appointed <laughs> to be on a vision casting committee at my church. <laughs> okay, I wasn't appointed. They bribed me. We were to create a vision for growth. Good people, good hearts, dying church. Literally. When you got more funerals than baptisms, you got a problem. Hence the need for a vision casting committee. Because in all the years of their existence, this little church had done nothing to retract, retract attain, and engage new members. And they had done nothing to stay relevant in the community in which they served. In an economy that had completely shifted around them, they were playing in a new playground, the same old game. Hence the need for a new vision. So we sat there, six of us in a basement classroom, facing a problem that was bigger than we were. Creating the vision wasn't the problem, casting it was. We knew we couldn't get up there and just tell them what to do. These were our respected elders, a long history and emotional investment in this church. We knew we had to do more than that. We couldn't just tell them what to do or tell them what we had to sell. <laughs> we had to get past the crossed arms because people don't want to be told what to do. We had to go from manipulating to motivating, from communicating to connecting, from getting, telling them what to do to actually making them want to do it. And if you think about it, every single one of us in this room is in that same position. We're selling something in every job, in every platform, no matter what our industry. We are all storytellers of our brand. We are all in the business of persuasion. And so how do we go from telling people what they need to do to making them actually want to do it? If we're all salespeople, the cardinal rule of sales is that people buy from people they like, trust, believe, and feel like they know. That's not about intellect. It's about emotion. That's not about your data. It's how you wrap it. That's not just about what you do with your customers or your team or your market. It's about the emotional experience that you create. You need a Trojan horse. It's what we learned on our vision casting committee. I don't have time to go into the whole story. You know it already. Remember the Greeks and the Trojans, they were fighting in that battle and the Greeks were waving around their swords and they're fighting by brawn and they're losing. So they're like, you know what? We need to use our brains instead. So we're going to send in that present. Remember that present, that big old wooden horse up on wheels? They send it rolling on in there. And you know what's inside that horse? Bunch of soldiers. They pop out in the battle, win the war. And why am I telling you all this? Because the term has forever become known as a strategy, a Trojan horse, to get into your opponent's safe place. Story, as we learned in that little vision casting committee, is your Trojan horse. I have spent my life studying it. How do we create those connections, even when you don't have time to tell a story? How do we get everybody to buy in? And if you want to find out what happened, 
in that little old church that forever changed their direction and changed the course of my life and career, then I would be happy to finish the story. But if you don't mind, for now, I got to go. I got a friend waiting for me in the lobby.